Thank you all for joining. I'm noticing the formatting's a little off on this computer, but hopefully that doesn't affect things in a noteworthy way. Um, my name is Ashraf. Um, I'm the founder at Debug Academy. Um, I formerly worked as a technical architect at Acquia for a few years. Um, and ultimately, I am a self-taught Drupal developer uh, who has also um, picked up React a number of years ago as I'm sure you all started to see the industry shift towards that, that direction. You know, very JavaScript heavy, very uh, much uh, a lot of passion and interest in decoupled projects. Um, so why should Drupal developers be interested in JavaScript or in learning JavaScript? Um, again, as I'm sure many of you have noticed, uh, JavaScript frameworks have really dominated the discourse on the web. Um, <clears throat> there are so many decoupled use cases. Um, we have mobile apps, but in the future, I imagine that um, the decoupled use cases are going to continue to present themselves um, in the forms of you know, uh, apps on your watches, potentially. Um, devices like Alexa and whatever the Google equivalent of Alexa is called. Um, and <clears throat> I forget what it's called, but um, there's also, of course, Drupal and even WordPress, at least WordPress.com, has a React app um, powering, uh, managing multiple WordPress websites at once. So the surface area that uh, can be addressed with um, decoupling your projects um, is much more vast than what you could accomplish um, on a non-decoupled project. But for those of us who have been doing web development for a while, uh, you might remember back when everybody really disliked JavaScript. Um, people used to say, like, oh, you use JavaScript? That's a joke. You know, like, why would you do that? Um, but all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, it became really popular. And if you're wondering why that happened, um, it's because in 2009, that's when uh, ES5, uh, the ES5 version of JavaScript uh, came out. And notice there were no updates after that. 2010, 2011, 12, 13, 14, there were no updates to the JavaScript language. And um, various reasons for that. Notice between nine, 1999 and 2009, there were also no updates. And also notice that ES4 never came out um, due to some you know, disagreements in the spec. Um, but it got back on track in 2015. And that's when ES6 came out. It came along with a number of improvements to the language itself um, and also a goal of having annual releases to continue to improve the language. And you can see they've been doing a pretty good job at that as well. 2016, 17, 18, 19, each of those years, they released updates to the JavaScript language. And um, <clears throat> so the question becomes, uh, what version can I use today? Because as you may know, PHP, uh, most of Drupal, is server side, which means as long as your server supports it, you're fine to use it. JavaScript, on the other hand, like CSS and HTML, is client side primarily, which means if the person visiting your website, if their browser does not support uh, the, the JavaScript you're using, then you can't use it. Um, so when you're writing CSS or JavaScript, you have to make sure that whatever you're writing is compatible with um, the browsers that people are visiting your website on. Um, so ES5, which is the last uncool version of JavaScript, <laughs> is very well supported. Um, but IE11 has limited support for ES6, which is the first version that people actually enjoy using. Um, and <clears throat> Drupal 9 does support IE11. So does that mean I can't use ES6 or above because I'm working on a Drupal 9 website? There are a couple of considerations, well, as you look at this sad little child, <laughs> a couple of considerations um, to keep in mind. Um, one, even though Drupal 9 supports um, IE11, maybe your client doesn't care about it, and then you don't have to worry about it. You can use ES6. But even if your client does care about IE11, there are 
compilers you can use to uh, transpile your ES6 back down to ES5. So what that means is, uh, think of SAS. If you're familiar with SAS and CSS, you write your code in SAS, but you don't deliver the SAS at the end of the day to your end user. You compile your SAS to CSS, and that's what the end user sees. It's very similar uh, with ES6. You can write your JavaScript in ES6, you can compile it down to ES5, and you can deliver that to the end user. Now, this is hopefully a temporary measure, um, but uh, it, it would apply to things like ES6, ES7, etc. Now, the way that Drupal Core handles this is they actually have files in Drupal Core, and instead of using a .js extension, they use .es6.js. And this is sort of to have a marker on the files to say this file is using features from ES6. And eventually, maybe in Drupal 10, they might rename all of those ES6 files to just .js because they might not need to compile them down anymore when we finally dropped IE11 support again in Drupal 10, as is the plan. Um, <clears throat> I did throw in an issue link down here. Um, there is an issue for extending that um, compilation process that Core is using and making it available to contrib and even custom modules. Um, it is not merged in yet, but uh, there, progress has been made on it. So you might get lucky, you might have a patch you can apply from that issue so that you can also leverage that same compilation process. Uh, but if it, even if you cannot, um, text editors, VS Code, for example, uh, they have a lot of plugins that will compile ES6 back to ES5. Search for something, um, you know, Node.js, Babel, etc. plugins. Um, you can use those to transpile your code. You can sort of manually mimic the process if you don't have the expertise on your team to recreate the build workflow that is available in Drupal core. Um, and if you're using uh, something like Acquia's BLT tool, um, that uh, very likely, if you run BLT front end, it may actually compile uh, the JavaScript down to ES5 for you. Okay, so now that we know we can use it, um, let's start to think about what, you know, what's the, all right, JavaScript is more enjoyable to write. Is that enough reason to use it? You know, why do people want to use it? Um, first of all, so for those of you who are truly new to JavaScript, um, give a high level introduction. PHP runs basically before the page is built. It's server side, it runs before the page is given to the user. JavaScript, on the other hand, runs after the user receives the page. Um, and that's why sometimes you'll see something similar with CSS and fonts loading, but sometimes the page will load and maybe you know, half a second later or 30 seconds later, the page will finish loading and then all of a sudden it's interactive. And that's because, again, JavaScript runs or can run on a fully built page. Um, some of the things that JavaScript can do that PHP cannot do, um, it can traverse the DOM, and I am aware of you know, certain plugins and Symfony components you can use to traverse the DOM, but I'm referring to you know, after the page is built, after it's reached the user. Um, JavaScript can traverse the DOM, which means it can crawl the contents of the page, it can find a div, and it can change the text, for example, within that div. Um, and that's the second bullet, it can manipulate the DOM. The DOM refers to the document object model, um, which is basically all of the elements on the page and a bit more. Um, JavaScript can react to user interactions. Um, just like in CSS, you hover over a link and the link color changes. JavaScript can, for example, react to a user scrolling on the page. Um, it uh, can periodically run code. You can set a timer every 30 seconds, run the following code with JavaScript. Um, and its code is asynchronous, which we'll talk about a bit more. Um, so I mentioned the DOM. Uh, again, that stands for Document Object Model. Um, and the DOM exists whether or not you're using JavaScript. You know, if you build an HTML page, you deliver that page to your user. Um, the DOM is a representation of everything on the page. And again, JavaScript has the ability to add, modify, remove um, elements within the DOM. So 
You can target the H1, you can delete it, replace it with different text, you can replace it with something entirely different. Um, you can create HTML elements on the fly and insert them into the page um, and more. You can add and remove elements. Uh, sometimes when you hover over a menu link, um, JavaScript might be responsible for uh, creating a drop-down link or, create, or adding a class um, to whatever it is that you hovered over to adjust the styling. Now I mentioned also that JavaScript is asynchronous. Um, <clears throat> PHP is not an asynchronous programming language and what asynchronous pretty much means is, or well let me say PHP. Um, <clears throat> PHP for example, if you run, uh, if you write a couple of lines of code one after the other, even if one of those lines of code is an API call that takes 30 seconds to run, PHP is going to wait for that line of code to finish. It's going to wait all 30 seconds before it goes to the next line and runs the next line. JavaScript, on the other hand, if you make an API call using JavaScript that takes 30 seconds to run, um, it may start making that API call, but it's not going to wait until it's finished. It's immediately going to skip ahead to the next line and run that line and the line after that and the line after that. So in JavaScript, it's possible for you to uh, finish running lines 2 through 10 before you finish li running line 1. And that's the meaning of asynchronous. It doesn't necessarily run in order. It doesn't necessarily wait for each line to finish before running the next line. It's one of the things you have to get used to when going from PHP to JavaScript. Um, now let's talk about some of the new features. You know, what is it that changed in JavaScript that makes people now like using it more than they used to? Let's talk about this. The variable this, and this is one of the hardest things for me to teach because somehow whenever I'm on these slides, I use the word this in conversation so many times and it muffles the message. Um, so in JavaScript, there is a variable named this and the variable this refers to the global object by default. Um, however, if you are inside of an object and you use the variable this, and you use the variable this, um, the variable this refers to the object itself. Okay, so it has a scope of the object that it's written inside of. Um, and that's even true if you uh, create a method for that object and you write this inside of that method. So that doesn't sound too terrible, but methods and functions are not the same. A method is a member of an object. So if, again, you create an object in JavaScript and the object has a method, um, the variable this inside of that method will refer to the object. However, if you create a function inside of that method, functions in JavaScript are also technically objects. So if you create a function inside of an object, the function will automatically receive its own this value. So its own variable named this, which points to not the outer object, but to the function. And what ends up happening is it becomes hard to keep track of the variable this. So you have this on the outermost level, you have this in an object, you have this in a function, you have this in a function in a function and they all refer to different things. So traditionally there have been some workarounds to that problem. One of the common solutions is to create another variable. You might create a variable named underscore this and set it equal to uh, whichever instance of this that you want to refer to. So for example, if you're interested in the global object this and that's what you want to keep working with everywhere else, you could say underscore this is equal to the global this. And now within your functions, you can keep referring to underscore this. You know you're going to be reliably interacting with the global objects, uh, or I should say the global this um, variable. Another option is referred to as binding. So if you can see the bold text dot bind, um, 
you can add that to the end of a fu function declaration. Um, you create a function, and at the closing curly brace of the function, you write dot bind, and you put this in parentheses. And what ends up happening is inside of that function, instead of creating its own this variable that refers to the function object, instead of doing that, it will take whichever variable you're binding, and it will use that variable as, um, as the value for its own this variable. Now, this is all hard to talk about, right? It, it's, it, might be a, it might be hard to follow, especially if you haven't done this a lot. So now let's see how ES6 fixes that issue. Um, so it's referred to as the fat arrow function. Um, some people refer to it as the arrow function. Um, but basically, instead of creating a function using the traditional syntax, instead of typing the word function followed by a function name followed by parentheses, you can get rid of the word function. Okay, you can go straight to putting the parentheses. And instead of putting curly braces right after those parentheses, you can put, again, this is what they refer to as the fat arrow. So it's an equal sign and a greater than sign. Um, and by doing that, you're still creating a function. But basically, it's like the function is no longer an object. So the function does not get its own scope for or, or its own variable this. Um, so you no longer have to worry about, you know, I created a function inside of a function inside of a function. There are three different values for this. Um, if you create your functions using the following syntax, um, it will not create an additional scope for the variable this. So a lot of developers who learn JavaScript in the past few years, they aren't even aware of the whole you know, dilemmas with the variable this. They just always use syntax, um, and they never have to worry about the scope of the variable this. There are a number of ways to actually um, write functions, and all of them comply with um, what I just described. They all have that feature of not creating a new variable uh, scope for the variable this. Um, as long as you use any of the syntaxes that do not include the word function, then you will re you know, reap those benefits. Um, Another one of the changes is um, traditionally we would use var to declare variables. We would say var underscore this equals this. Um, but now there are two other ways to declare variables, uh, let and const. Um, and to simplify it, simplify your process uh, when deciding should I use var, let, or const, um, you can sort of follow this workflow. Should I use var? No. <laughs> Should I use let? If I need to change the value, then yes, use let. Should I use const? If I will not need to reassign the value, or if it's an object or an array, which you know they are mutable, so it's also OK to use const for those. Um, so basically, you should use const if you're not going to need to redeclare the variable. You're only going to declare it once you should use let otherwise. Const cannot be reassigned. So if I say const um, age equals 40, I cannot then say age equals 41. It won't let me change that value. So what's the difference? Why shouldn't we use var? Uh, take a look at this example. In this example, we are declaring three variables using each method of declaration. We're declaring using var, let, and const. Right after that, there's an if statement. We just said if true to make sure it always executes. Inside of that if, if statement, we are declaring three new variables using the same variable names and the same variable types. And look after that if statement. In, in Before the if statement and inside of the if statement, we use the same values. But notice after the if statement, when we log each of those variables, the value is different when it was declared as a var. So let's talk about why. When you use var, 
um, var is not block scoped. So that means um, when I create a variable using var, um, I've created it, for example, in the function um, I've created it in, um, that variable will carry through into all of the uh, children, into all of the if statements, for example, or all of the switch statements, and so on. Um, so inside of the if statement in this example, when I, when I redeclare my var, I'm not actually redeclaring it. It's the same variable. Because var is not scoped to that block level, var doesn't care that it's inside of curly braces. Um, it just inherits the same variable from outside. But let and cons, on the other hand, they recognize we are inside of an if statement and we were created inside of an if statement. We're not gonna mess with anything outside of this if statement. We exist only inside of these curly braces. So that's the real difference. Um, so it tends to be safer to use let and const because you're not going to accidentally override a value outside of your if statement or outside of your function or um, etc. Okay, Let's see how we're doing on time, pretty good. I've been moving a little quickly because normally this is an hour and a half presentation, but now I realize we've got plenty of time. <laughs> Um, okay, so in PHP, uh, when you create a function, um, you have the ability to set default parameters. So you can create a function and you can say, um, you know, function the variable x equal to 1. And what that means is if someone calls on your function and they don't pass a value, x will have a value of 1. But if you do pass a value, x will have whatever value you pass. So that's a default parameter, sort of like a fallback value if none is passed in. Um, so in ES6, you now have the ability to do the same thing in JavaScript. You can set default values on functions. The behavior is slightly different because in PHP, we have null, which is the end all be all of emptiness. Null means there truly is no value, whereas in JavaScript, Null means you have a value of null. Um, so in JavaScript, if you pass in null, it's not the same as leaving it empty. Um, it will not, there goes my wedding ring. <laughs> I'll get that after. Um, it will not um, inherit the value that um, is, is the default value. If in JavaScript, if you want it to um, use the default value, you have to actually type the word undefined or type nothing at all. Um, now, this is a nice feature. Um, so if you've used Drupal and Twig, um, and you compare it to theming in Drupal 7, where we had the TPL PHP files, remember in Drupal 7, we would actually write PHP files, and maybe you would print out strings using quotation marks, and concatenate strings, and all that stuff. And we don't really have to do that anymore in Twig. Um, in ES6 and above, there are now what are called template literals. And basically, in your JavaScript code, you can use not single or double quotes, but you can use back ticks. So very similar to a single quote, just a little more slanty. Um, so you can use those back ticks to surround your HTML code. And um, basically, it allows you to use single quotes, double quotes, etc. Uh, etc. inside of your content um, without sort of breaking the string. Um, but also, if you notice on the last line of this, there's a dollar sign and some curly braces. And what that allows you to do is almost toggle back and forth between I'm writing a string and I'm writing JavaScript. You see, so inside of this, again, what's called a template literal, I can put back ticks, I can write all the HTML in the world, and I don't really have to worry about escaping it. Um, but if I want to write some JavaScript code, if I want to write some conditional logic, I can put a dollar sign and curly braces. And anything in between those curly braces takes you out of template literal land back into JavaScript land where you can write whatever JavaScript you like. Uh, what people normally use that for is what you can see here, uh, sort of a shorthand if statement. Um, where, you know, 
if this value is true, then return the following text. Otherwise, return some alternative text. Another nice, interesting, but nice feature um, is destructuring. Um, and what I like to think of it, at, it as is the ability to mass declare variables. So imagine you were given a node object from Drupal, and you were given it um, to your JavaScript file. Now imagine you wanted to create a variable named title with the node's title, um, named created with the node created date, and author with the author's ID. Um, you might think that you have to write uh, let title equal node.title, let created equals node.created, let was the last one author equal node.author. Um, but instead of doing that line by line, you can use what's called destructuring. So you type the word let, and then you type if it's for an object, you type uh, curly braces, and then you write the names of all of the properties in the object that you sort of want to extract. And what it does is it does two things. It declares the variables. So in this example on the screen, it declares two variables, one named debug, one named Drupal. And to the right of the equal sign, you see an object. So in the example I was speaking about, where you have a node, um, you would actually basically be writing let curly brace title comma created comma author equal node. And what it does is it extracts those three values from the object. It gets the title property, the created property, and the author property. And it creates three new variables in JavaScript. Um, again, title, created, and author. And it creates those three variables and it also populates them with the corresponding values from the object. So it's a shorthand way to both extract values from an object and declare variables. It works if the variables you want to declare have the same name as the properties you want to extract. So that's the top half. The bottom half is also referred to as destructuring, but that is array destructuring. So instead of the top half where we said we want to pull specific properties which happen to have specific names. The bottom half, we're saying, we want to pull specific values from the array. And we can actually name these ones whatever we like, because rather than based on the array key, it's actually based on the position in the array. So you type, again, let. You could also do this with const um, or var. Uh, but you type let, and you put those square brackets. Type whatever variable name you like. Um, and then you put comma separated lists. And in this example, we have the word one, comma, a blank, comma, the word three. And what, what is actually happening is we're creating a variable named one, which will automatically take the first value from that array. The second position, which is intentionally blank, we are not creating a variable. We are skipping the second position in that array. And in the third position, we're creating a variable named three, and it's progressing to the third value from that array, taking that value, populating the new variable. And when I say taking that value, I don't mean removing, I mean copying. Um, so of course, the values are still inside of the array as well. Okay. You might start to notice a pattern with some of these new features. Um, they're all just about doing things faster, writing less code, uh, repetitive operations um, that you know now have shorthand uh, versions. Um, so there's also something called enhanced object literals, um, which, again, in the past, you would have to, or in the past, if you were to create a variable uh, named the letter A, let's say, um, and it had a value. If you then wanted to create an object which had a property whose name was the same as the variable's name, you would have to manually type in that property name. Um, so if you wanted to create an object where you said the property name is going to be the letter A, 
the property value is going to come from the variable a. You used to have to type a colon a. Um, but in ES6, if you want to create an object whose property name is the same as a variable name and whose uh, value is the same as the variable's value, you no longer have to type curly brace name of the variable colon value of the variable. Um, you just type, you, you create your object and you just put the variable in the object. And what that does is it automatically creates a new property whose name is the same as the name of the variable and whose value comes also from that variable. Um, so, you know, another example, if you are working with um, a node and someone passes you uh, a variable named title and you want to go to your node object, you want to create a title property on your node object and you want to pass that title property the variable that was just given to you. Um, you could basically create your object and you can say object equals curly brace or node equals curly brace and you can put the title variable directly and automatically it will create an object with a property named title and it will take that value from the title variable that you passed. Um, some of these things are a little tricky to talk about, so make sure you go, you know, play with these afterwards. Um, there are websites like jsfiddle.net, which you can just pull a website up and try these things out and um, see for yourself. And on websites like that, uh, sometimes you can uh, turn on automatic compilation. Um, so you can write ES6 on the left and it will immediately transform it to ES5 on the right. So you can try out these features and see what's happening. Another nifty feature is the spread operator. Um, it allows you to, in the example has two dots, it should, have, it should actually have three, um, but it allows you to basically take all of the values from an array or take all of the values from an object and pass them individually. So imagine you had an object or imagine you had an array um, with a, a couple of nodes that you wanted to pass into a function and you wanted to pass them in, um, you wanted to make your function call, uh, let's say the function was named merge nodes. Uh, so you want to call merge nodes and you want to pass it node one, comma, node two, comma, node three. If you have an array that contains node one, node two, node three, um, let's say that this array is named all nodes, um, what you can do is you can call your function um, merge nodes and in parentheses you can type dot 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 all nodes and JavaScript will automatically sort of explode that array. It will take all the values out of that array. It will pass them one by one as a comma separated list um, of arguments. This is actually especially useful if you want to, let's say, clone an object. Because in JavaScript, sometimes you, especially in React, sometimes you want to clone an object, you want to replace it with a, a new object. And the easiest way to do that is to create a new object by typing your curly braces, take the old object and put it as the value inside of that new object, but start it with dot, dot, dot. So if you create a new object, and its only value is dot, 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 some other object, what ends up happening is it takes that other object, it takes every single value from it, every property value pair, and it uh, passes them into the object as a comma separated list, and it basically builds you an entirely new object with all of the same uh, properties and values. And again, you can do the same thing with arrays, um, you can do the same thing with uh, arguments to functions. And again, this is very common in uh, React. Um, it's, it's also useful if someone's giving you an array or an object and you don't know how many parameters it has or what the parameters are called, um, then you can use that to pass all of the parameters into another function individually. Um, in, in PHP, we might do something like a for each loop where you loop through an object and you I don't know, pass each of the values one by one within that loop. 
uh, maybe something like that. Um, but in JavaScript, you just type dot, 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 and it will separate those values out for you and pass them as separate arguments. Now, earlier I mentioned that JavaScript is asynchronous, and I gave the example of if on the first line you made an API call, it's very likely that the next 10 lines would finish running before the first line finishes. Um, but sometimes that's problematic. If I want to make an API call and then I want to format the data I receive from the API call, um, and this is a very common uh, bug, uh, you know, you don't want to make the API call and then format it and have the formatting code run before the API call finishes. Um, so <clears throat> sometimes you want to tell JavaScript, you know, I know you're asynchronous by default, but I want these lines to be synchronous. Um, and so there's a concept introduced in ES6 uh, referred to as promises, um, where instead of making your API call directly, where you say, um, you know, go get this value from this URL and then immediately format it, instead of doing that, um, you can make a promise uh, where you say um, values from the API are equal to a new promise. And inside of that promise, you make your API call. And what ends up happening is the line one technically finishes running immediately, but the value stored in that variable is a promise. Um, so when you get to line two and line three, again, line one does have a value, but the value is a promise. And what a promise is, it's, it's a, a, a guarantee that later on, we will convert into some other value. We'll convert into an object, an array, an integer, something else. Um, now, that, that's, that's, I've painted part of the picture, right? Because what next, right? I say I, I'm, I have a promise, it will be something else later. Promises are venable. Um, I'm not making up these words, this is how it's talked about. Um, so for each promise, um, you can say, for example, I make an API call, then do something else. So you might say, um, promise, the first promise is to make an API call, then, which means wait for it to finish, when it finishes, do the following. So then maybe you're going to format the output, uh, maybe you're going to display it, um, and you can have multiple thens, one after the other. Um, you can also, as you see here, you can have a catch, so sort of like a try catch block in PHP. Um, so you can have multiple thens and you can have a catch. So you would have a catch in case any of those uh, calls failed. So within that promise, you might have some code to detect, did this API call fail? If it did fail, um, let me throw an error and that will skip all of the rest of the then calls and it'll go straight to the catch and you can handle that error. Um, if you're familiar with try and catch in PHP, you might also be familiar with finally. Uh, finally allows you to run code regardless of whether it was successful. So whether it was caught or whether it finished normally, um, finally runs at the end. ES6 did not introduce finally. Um, I believe ES9 did. So you know, Drupal core, I think they're going as far as ES6. If you're writing custom code, you can use ES9 as long as you're compiling it down. Um, but I think the way you should handle it is as soon as you write any code, which is ES9, for example, you should rename your file from .js to .es9.js. Um, sort of give yourself some information. You know, we cannot stop compiling this file until ES9 is fully supported by all of the browsers. Um, and because of that, uh, because of the fact that there are maybe features that you want to use that are in ES7 or above, um, you, you do sort of have to, not, don't take it for granted that these, there are new features and we can use all of them. You really need to sort of keep track. Um, so most teams restrict themselves to ES6. They usually say, there are features in ES7, but on this project, we're not going to use those. We're going to make sure we stick to ES6. So whenever you're looking up these new features, 
you might want to go to a site like caniuse.com and search for the feature you're using. That would tell you cross-browser compatibility, um, but through there um, or through the Mozilla website, um, the MDN documentation, uh, you can find which version of JavaScript did the feature come out with or will the feature come out with. Okay, now with Drupal, if you're going to do a decoupled Drupal site, for example, you are going to make API calls. And so you have to ask, or you will encounter this question, how do I make those API calls? Fetch is the native option that's available in JavaScript. Um, it can return a promise and um, it gets the job done. There's Axios, which is a third-party plugin. You can download that with npm, npm install Axios. Um, it's very intuitive and very easy to use. You can basically do something like Axios get this URL, and it'll behave exactly how you expect it to. Fetch, on the other hand, um, requires you to write more code to get the expected results. Uh, because, for example, if you make an API call and the endpoint says error, you know, error, this was an invalid request, Fetch is going to say, the API call worked, success, they told us it's an error. Um, but Axios would say, hey, they told us it was an error. You probably think that should be treated like an error, so I'm going to throw an error. So Axios kind of gets the job done without you needing to think about it too much. Um, Ajax comes with jQuery. You might be used to that if you've been doing Drupal. Um, that's the upside of it, familiarity. Um, downside is it requires jQuery, and it's typically excessive. Um, so decoupled projects typically are not build on, built on top of Ajax for the API calls. So what should you use? Comes down to personal preference. If you want to write less code and you want your job as a developer to be easier, use Axios. Um, but if you want your website to have less code, so if you don't want to download a third-party dependency, use Fetch. So that will make you write more code, but it will make your website have less code. Um, I'd say most websites, probably Axios, um, if you're building something like Amazon.com where every byte matters because you have so many visitors, maybe you want to use Fetch. Okay, in Drupal, there are a number of ways to expose the data through API, um, or I should say exposing data to JavaScript. Um, JSON API is available in core, and therefore it's essentially the standard um, option. There is GraphQL. Um, nice thing about GraphQL, it, you can download it as a contrib module, uh, but it can be installed either server-side or client-side. And what it does for you is, uh, think of it as uh, middleware between your back-end and your front-end. Uh, so it can take as many inputs as it needs to from the back-end. It can say, all right, we're going to take some sort, one of the sources of data is going to be from Drupal, one of the sources is going to be a third-party API. And what it outputs is another API. It's essentially an API endpoint, uh, which can be formatted however you like. So JSON API, it's, uh, it's a spec that Drupal core follows very closely. Um, the data is exposed in a very you know, predictable way. GraphQL, on the other hand, um, is more like a middleware. You can have JSON API data go to GraphQL. GraphQL can reformat it in a way that's easier for your front-end developers to use, and then you can pass it through to them. Uh, some teams prefer GraphQL because, again, you format it however you like for your front-end team. So your front-end team might not even know you're using Drupal because you truly can format it however you like. Um, and if you ever migrate from Drupal 7 to 8 to 9 to WordPress and then back to Drupal, um, you can keep GraphQL the whole time. You can keep your front-end API exactly the same. So your front-end developers don't even know you switched. Um, so that's the upside of GraphQL. Um, and then through the DOM, JavaScript has ac access to the DOM. So if you're only doing a little bit of decoupling, think about whether you need an API endpoint at all. Sometimes you can just expose some data in Twig, and then you can traverse the DOM, sort of scrape that data from your own page, pass it into your React component or whatever you like, and use it that way. That makes sense if you're doing like one component or something very small, but it doesn't typically make sense for a fully decoupled website. 
So what are the advantages of decoupling? Um, again, it gives you the ability to write your content once, you know, in Drupal and disperse it to multiple sources. Again, the watch, the mobile app, the website, uh, billboard, etc. cetera. Um, separation of concerns. So you can focus on the backend development work. Front-end developers can um, focus on front-end using JavaScript and CSS, and they don't need to learn Twig. They don't need to learn something that's designed for the backend tool that you're using. Um, so uh, it also makes it so that you can potentially hire front-end developers who don't know Drupal at all, don't know PHP at all. They know React or they know something that, you know, uh, that is popular at the time. Um, that's one of the advantages of decoupling. It makes it much easier to build a team of front-end developers very quickly. Um, and also, there's a vast community, very, very large community of people, you know, using React, using Vue.js, et cetera. Um, and so it's often much easier to get help on your uh, questions and such. And there are also, just like Drupal has modules, um, React and Vue, et cetera, they have also contributed uh, components. They have basically design systems that are contributed um, where you can say, oh, you have like a really fancy slider widget. So Material UI is one of them um, for React. You can get all these React components and then you can just start passing in your Drupal data and all of a sudden you have a really good looking website that's highly interactive. Drawbacks of decoupling. Um, there's an additional point of failure. So now you have two completely separate tech stacks. Um, the front end safeguards built into something like Drupal are lost. So for example, content validation on the front end, um, you have to recreate that. Um, also the accessibility, Drupal is pretty accessible out of the box. Uh, but if you throw away all of Drupal's front end, most of the accessibility work that's done is in the front end. So you're going to have to redo it. And that's no small feat. Um, I actually think that doesn't get enough attention. Uh, but also the caching layers. Drupal has a very thorough caching system with cache tags and such. Um, as soon as you fully decouple, uh, now you have to worry about my whole front end being served with JavaScript. And browsers like to cache JavaScript. So if I make an update to my front end, it's possible my users won't receive that update. right? It's not enough for me to clear Drupal's cache if their browser cached it. So that's a whole other layer you have to worry about. There are, there are solutions, um, but they're not all that simple. Um, so it does make uh, caching for complex websites more difficult. So what should you use? I would say you should do a fully decoupled project. Um, if your site exists on multiple mediums. So if I have a, mo a mobile app that features most of the content that my main site uses, then I'm already decoupling my mobile app. If the data comes from Drupal, I'm already decoupling the mobile app. I already have to maintain that API. Um, so at that point, you can sort of double dip and benefit by uh, decoupling your website as well, um, especially if there's not one single primary source of data. Um, if you're pulling in data from multiple sources. Progressively decoupled, think of it like partially decoupled. Um, that makes sense if you want to include some external information on your website, but really it can probably fit into a block. Um, so for example, on the Debug Academy website, um, we have an internal task uh, management sort of system. That is a React app and that is decoupled. But the rest of the site, the front end, the course list page, that, that data all comes from Drupal. We don't really benefit much from decoupling all of that. So we are de progressively decoupled. Most of the site is not decoupled. One page is decoupled. Um, pseudo decoupled um, is sort of where you might be scraping some data from the page and decoupling it, or you're, um, or you're also, you know, um, yeah, Basically that, you're, you're, you're serving the front end from Drupal, but you're supplementing it, you're enhancing it with some React apps, but really the primary source is Twig. Um, that might make sense uh, if, the, if you need your non-developers to be able to manage layout. If you want them to use tools like Layout Builder, it might make sense to do very light decoupling. Um, 
Otherwise, it's usually best not to decouple a Drupal website. Um, and one more note, just because JavaScript makes sense for your project, it doesn't necessarily mean that decoupling or that uh, you need to use React. Um, this website, I don't know what will happen if I click this link because it is the, no, oh, it did not pop up, um, because it is the conference screen. There we go. Okay, so this is an example of a decoupled app that I'm working on. And I said decoupled. This is an app that I'm working on. And um, it is somewhat interactive. I put in numbers here. The numbers on the right side change. Um, you know, I can, um, I can, I'm just trying to show you that it does change even more. So you see even another set of inputs appears and it is all sort of interactive. Um, it almost reaches the point where I want to use React because there are so many moving parts that need to be updated at the same time. But it's still a small enough number that I don't need to use React. So in this case, we chose not to use React because we felt like we could wrap our heads around, you know, there are three numbers on the right that need to change. There are two sets of inputs that need to change under certain scenarios. We can manage that with a couple of functions in JavaScript. Um, if there were a lot more moving parts, I would have gone with React. If we had five more areas of the website that change, you know, dynamically, I would probably go to React. Okay, and oops, I think we're on the last slide. Okay, yeah, and that's basically it. Um, I run Debug Academy. We are in a booth. Go all the way to the right, as far as you can, uh, next, next to the coffee in the expo hall. Um, feel free to come by, say hello. We do have an architect series, so even if you're an experienced Drupal developer, uh, we can teach you all about performance, about maintainability uh, of your code, um, how to do front ends in Drupal, um, quality assurance, and more. Um, we have also, if you are looking to get into backend development, we've got short courses on PHP, Symfony, as well as advanced module development. Um, and of course, we have a couple of classes on React and advanced React, uh, specifically geared towards a Drupal audience. So if you're maybe a programmer, comfortable writing code, um, maybe you're an experienced PHP developer, um, that those courses would be good for you because we dive right into the code. We don't spend too much time saying this is what a variable is because we expect you to have that background from, for example, PHP or JavaScript, and we get right into integrating it with uh, Drupal and React. Um, yeah, most of these classes are short term, and if anyone you know is looking to start their career in Drupal, we also have a part-time three-month course where we do a pretty deep dive in all things Drupal and help people start their careers. Um, I hope you found this helpful, and I hope to see you in the Expo Hall. Thank you.